Welcome to the Garage, ladies and gentlemen. This is our podcast, and it's our posting on Facebook as well. And I must thank you up front for all the comments that you make and the calls that we get around the dining room table. Thank you. We've got regular callers now, Pete. Did you know? No, I didn't. Well, that's good. Regular callers. That's good. That's wonderful. And from very different places in the world. Anyway, I appreciate all your comments and all your calls. Um, it's cool today. It's kind of like uh, there's a, a nip in the air. But the uh, people tell me, oh, no, 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 the summer, there'll be a couple of surprisingly hot days coming up. I don't think so. I think we've gone straight. In. Well, the, the plants think we've gone into autumn. <laughs> They've got all their autumn colours up, which m makes some suburbs particularly look really wonderful. Nothing like, you know, liquid ambers and maples and um, pistachios. They're beautiful. Have you ever seen a pistachio tree, Pete? No, I haven't. No. Blood red. Green, green all summer, then it goes blood red. No, I Great seen street one. tree. Beautiful. Mm. Ash, claret ash, they're beautiful too. Anyway, I'm, I've made up my mind on Friday. Mm, perhaps not Friday. Fridays are always busy with the live broadcast. Uh, Saturday. I'll go up to um, the hills. I know a couple of places and they, if you bring a ute, and thank God I've got a ute, most practical vehicle I own, um, I'll take the ute up and fill it with, uh, with wood. Because what they do is they, um, you, you go into the yard and you load up the wood, then they put your truck over a weighing machine that tells them how much your load is and what you have to pay. Very simple system. Then all I've got to do is bring it back and unload it. But that's good. Need the exercise. That's good. Now I must tell you too, just quickly, Pete uh, went into hospital Friday. Do you mind if I tell no, people? No, I don't mind. No. Because I think it's really good news. Uh, Pete has, has been out of breath, as indeed I've been at various times. Uh, but they didn't send me off for an angiogram. Uh, they sent me off and gave me Ozampic to lose weight. <laughs> uh, look, I, I think I'd rather have the Ozampic than I would an angiogram where they put the wire up your uh, vein. Artery. Artery. Piece of cake. And they take it all the way up to the heart. Yes. And, and they discovered it. that you had a blockage. And I was watching it. <laughs> well... Dear boy, you were paying for it, so you may as well get some entertainment out of yes, it. Yes. <laughs> but what happens if you see them doing something wrong? Are you allowed to say, stop everything? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Hold the show. Well, anyway, they did, I take it, found, they did find a blockage. Almost fully blocked, yes. So that was Friday, mm. and you tell me you felt... Better Instant. almost instantly. Instant, instantly. Yes. Yes. Wow. Well, I'll bet you're glad that you went to the doctor. Yes, very, very glad. Yes. Yeah. Well, you've officially had a uh, a valve grind and a decoke, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. which we all need yep. once or twice in our lives. Indeed. Um, anyway, I hope you've had a, a nice weekend, and you're looking forward to a wonderful new week, which will bring us all sorts of interesting things. Let's hope never again the sadness of this past weekend. The Prime Minister says that it wasn't an act of terrorism. Well, it mightn't be an act of ideological terrorism. But believe me, those shoppers at Bondi Junction were terrified. They were terrorised. You can't gild that, Lily. This is not America. But that's not to say we haven't had mass killings. There was, uh, let me see, Hoddle Street, Port Arthur, and I don't know if you remember the Strathfield Centre. I think it was around 1991. That was a massacre. The Strathfield Centre Massacre. We don't have quite as many as they have in America because of our, our gun laws. 
But are we so emotionally crippled and politically correct that we cannot adequately report these sort of events, attribute blame, learn lessons? Well, lots of, uh, lots of predictable speculation, malicious, mischief, yes, you'd expect that. But the offender, now identified as Joel Couchy, killed five people. Six. Well, six, including him. No, no, no. No, he was the seventh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. There were six victims. Six victims yeah. and 12 wounded. Yeah. 12 wounded, some seriously. Most of the victims were women. Yeah, her mother, her mother with a young child, yeah. she was killed, yeah. And now, for, for a random attack, a disproportionate number of women armed with a large hunting knife or bowie knife or something, the alleged killer was shot dead by the police. The inspector who took him down as being hailed as a hero. I think the real hero was the unarmed shopper who picked up a shopping centre bollard and confronted the guy on the escalator. Did you see that? That footage went round the world and I understand why. But what was Couchy's motive? People do, don't go on a senseless killing spree like this. If it's not racial or religious, it's usually political. Now Bondi is a very Jewish area of Sydney and with the ongoing events in the Middle East one has got to ask the question was the assailant a convert to Islam? I've got no idea. It's a reasonable question. If we're allowed to ask it of course. The events at Bondi on Saturday were most likely the results of the continuing collapse of our capacity to handle mental illness. You know here in Adelaide, and I understand most states in Australia are the same, we have deinstitutionalized mental health, mental illness. The results of which you can see walking up and down Green Hill Road and Glen Osmond Road on any given day, aimlessly and let's hope harmlessly, but possibly a danger to themselves and everyone else. And who made that decision? Perhaps somebody could step up and accept responsibility and admit that he or she got it wrong. You see, you know, the truth is, sadly, some people are criminally insane and some people should be locked up. I think the need to lock them up trumps all of the civil rights that these people may trot out. Some people need to be locked up. <sighs> dear oh dear. And somebody messaged me to tell me that dear friend of mine John Singleton, John Singleton's daughter, 20 years old, was one of the women killed at the Bondi Junction shopping centre. Oh John, I, I can't imagine what you're going through. That's absolutely terrible. Can you imagine anyone stabbing a nine-month-old baby? You know, you come across to the pram, you pull the bunny rabbit blanket off, and start stabbing the child. Could anyone be so insane? I don't know. But listen, speaking of insanity, it looks, looks like a significant escalation of violence in the Middle East, with Iran launching waves of drones and cruise missiles to attack Israel. And they have seized an Israeli ship in the Straits of Hamas. Jordan threatening to shoot down any aircraft or drone that violates its airspace. Not a lot of camaraderie in the Islamic world, one would think. Anyway, to some extent, and I can understand it if it's otherwise, but to some extent, Israel would be very well advised, very smart, 
not to retaliate. Shoot the bloody things down and protect yourself best you can, but don't escalate it. But we'll see what happens. We'll know in the next little while. We're recording Monday's show, today's show on Sunday, so I'm not sure uh, where that has developed or how it's developed. A couple of local things here in Adelaide I want to mention to you. A re-imaging of the South Australian Museum. Re-imaging is a fantastic modern world word. <laughs> re-imaging, re-imaging. I don't know to this point enough about it to comment, but a lot of passionate demonstrators on North Terrace on Saturday. Like so many things these days, trouble can be avoided by just explaining to the community what is going on and why. Don't be heavy-handed and high-minded. Tell us. Tell us. With these changes to the South Australian Museum award-winning outfit, what is the problem you're trying to fix? I mean, our museum is terrific. Don't think it needs improving. But if it does, explain it to us. And the other thing is the Lord Mayor of Adelaide, Jane Lomax-Smith, who I think was the Labor member for Adelaide for some years. She's now the Lord Mayor. She wants empty office space in the CBD to be converted to residential apartments. Now on the surface of that, that sounds like a, a good idea. Sadly, it seems that we have more vacancies than any other capital city. Why is this? I don't know. You look at the bigger picture and you try and find out why people, they may be people who own office, offices or they may be people who go shopping, but why the bigger picture should be finding out why people have been voting with their feet and leaving the city. But despite this we seem to be building office blocks in the CBD hand over fist. Spending hundreds of millions of dollars. If there's no demand, why are they doing it? I don't agree with the Lord Mayor when she says that office space can be easily converted to apartments. Unless, of course, the building is constructed with this future option in mind. That, that, that might be a possibility, but not the way it is, I don't think. I think the, the real problem, the real problem, is that councils are killing the goose that lays the golden egg. We ratepayers. You know how they're doing it? Well, I mentioned it. Rates, taxes, parking, regulations, fines... People come into the CBD to try and do some shopping and they're fined out of their minds for simply trying to support the people who are paying the rates and the taxes. Just makes absolutely no sense. For lots of reasons, people are avoiding going into the city, and I understand it. The suburbs are a lot more user-friendly. If the Lord Mayor wanted to reinvigorate our city and that's where all of this is coming from you see she has a lot of the levers that could do this easily but for some reason she doesn't want to admit that or she doesn't want to use them or she doesn't want to confront the possibility that the council may have to be a little bit more amenable you know, we, we, the customer, we have a lot of pull. The Prime Minister has announced a boost for local industry. Ah, I can hear you. Terrific. It's the Future Made in Australia Act. Depends on how you want to word that. The Future Made in Australia. Or the Future Made in Australia. Anyway, you get the drift. It's clever. Well thought out. 
It's a renaming or rebadging and a bringing together of a few different initiatives. The perception is good. It is. The idea of making more stuff in Australia appeals to me. We can probably never get back to where we were. I mean, we need to be more independent. Now, the government won't mention this, but the fundamental question is, of course, how did we get ourselves in this position in the first place? Big, important question. Well, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. It goes back to 1975 and the Whitlam signing up Australia to the Lima Declaration. I'll come back to that in a second. Our problem is that just about everyone in the world can make things more cheaply than we can. And this is mainly our doing. Our doing. But let me say, if this is about picking winners, the government picking winners, individual industries and businesses. Government is never, never good at that. Taxpayers' money into this or that, well, may be popular with this or that, but it fails time and time again. We here in South Australia remember the multifunction polis. Pete, do you remember the multifunction polis? No. <laughs> You're too young. <laughs> oh God, I do. What a disaster that was. Which came along after the button plan bankrupted the car industry. I remember him saying, it wasn't on my show, but I remember him saying, if we had a car industry, my plan would have made it so much more efficient. Hmm. <laughs> and this idiot kept his job. Everything is cause and effect. I believe we wouldn't be in this position except for the Whitlam government back in 1975 signing the Lima Declaration which divested Australia of our manufacturing industry and therefore our competitiveness in favour of third world countries because it was the right communist thing to do. I still think it was a great act of treachery, sponsored of course, helped along the way by the trade union movement. Huh? Pete, what have I got wrong here? Trade union movement supposed to look after the worker? Mm -hmm. And we signed up to something that would get rid of countless thousands of jobs? Insane. Insane. Treachery. If there were experienced journalists at this announcement, he or she would have asked a question or two. For example, off the top of my head, why a former Labour government would put us in this position in the first place? But the journalists these days, in this case, wouldn't remember 1975? And anyway, they don't ask questions. They just read the media release. Thanks to various governments, we are vulnerable. They've all played a part in it. We know overseas supply chains are unreliable. Our supply and backup and storage of petrol and diesel is totally inadequate. It's a matter of days. Well, it should be months. We used to have, of course, refineries. We didn't depend on containers bringing in our fuel. But what do these idiots in Canberra concentrate on? Hmm? The voice. Alternative energy. Zero emissions. Just like Whitlam, ideology drives this Labour government and I hope it drives them out of office. Because they deserve to get a good swift electoral kick in the bum, if you ask me. Um, I had a time, aren't I, Pete? Yep. Yep. Uh, today's the 15th, isn't it? I reckon. Uh, yeah. Glasses? Yes. Yep, 15th. Happy birthday, if you're having a birthday or a wedding anniversary. 1912 RMS Titanic sinks at 2.27 a.m. off the Newfoundland coast as the band played on. 
loss of between 1,490, pardon me, and 1,635 lives, including Edward Smith, English naval captain of the Titanic. He was just 62. John Jacob Astor IV, American businessman, real estate developer, the Astoria Hotel, wow. Soldier, richest passenger on board the Titanic. Dies aboard the Titanic, he was just 47. Uh, William T. Steed, British newspaper editor, the Pall Mall Gazette, dies in the sinking, he was just 62. Uh, many a tragic story. That was this day in 1912. Now, on this day in 1930, sorry, 1923, the first sound on film performance was shown at the Rialto Theatre in New York City. Sound! Wow! Leonardo da Vinci, Italian painter, sculptor, scientist, visionary, born Vinci, Florence, Italy, this day in 14. 52. So if it's your birthday today, you're sharing it with some luminaries and a few tragedies. He died in 1519, by the way. Abraham Lincoln, 16th US President, dies from gunshot wounds at the age of 56. It was 1865, just at the end of the Civil War. The first British motorised burial, which occurred on this day in 1901, which I guess all the burials before this day were horse-drawn. So now you've got to drive in an automobile. The last road. Ah, the lady, I was born on her birthday, Greta Garbo. She was born on the 18th of September, where she was a few years older than me. But in uh, 1990 she died... Uh, 84 years old, she was the one who used to say, I want to be alone. Swedish actress, Greta Garbo. Boston Somerville installs the world's first telephone in Massachusetts in 1877. Wow! Tommy Cooper, British comedian and mu musician, collapses and dies on stage. He was 61. Gee. You know the old saying about, you know, leave them laughing? It'd be hard to... <laughs> oh, dear. Well, look. I mean, how do you top that? It's a hard act to follow. Uh, 1984. Tommy Cooper. I must admit I don't know the name or I wouldn't be so disrespectful. Notre Dame, the cathedral in Paris, 2019, burnt to the... Well, it didn't quite burn to the ground because of a lot of stone, but there was an awful lot of wood as well. Anyway, they've almost got it rebuilt. They won't have it quite ready for the Paris Olympic Games, but it's almost rebuilt. First helicopter flight, one hour's duration, that was in 1941. Um, yum, 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 yum. The first Impressionist exhibition opens in Paris. Claude Monet, uh, Edgar Degas, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, uh, 1874. No doubt it was a sellout. Or, you know what I mean, they sold everything, <laughs> I would think. Sidney Chapman, Chaplin, the English actor, half-brother of Charlie Chaplin, and his business manager dies at 80 in 1965. Um, Elizabeth Montgomery's birthday, 1933. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for viewing the Court of Public Opinion, ladies and gentlemen. Look forward to your company tomorrow. I'm Jeremy Cordo, Peter Clayton with his not quite a new heart, is it? No, but I feel like a new man. A new man! Peter Clayton and I'll be back tomorrow. Believe in yourself and goodbye for now.